was particularly appropriate to have as our speaker someone who knew Bob McKinsey, who knew him from his academic context at Colorado College, and who served with him before we lost Paul to UCCS because he was initially with us as a sabbatical replacement. But it's also appropriate because Paul's work and Bob's work have some important resonances. Bob McJimsey, as most of you know, was a lion of this parish. He was the warden of this parish in some very trying times, and he defended it most ably. He was also a wonderful teacher for many years at Colorado College, and one of the salient features of his teaching was his conviction of the authenticity of the spiritual motivations of many of the historical figures whom he brought students into conversation with. Um, so Paul Harvey has a similar disposition. He is an eminent scholar. We are very lucky to have him in the hood, so to say. And he is distinguished professor of history in the University of Colorado. He has authored many books principally about African-American religious experience. And like Bob McJimsey, he has immense respect for an ability to tease out the reality of the agency of people grounded in their faith traditions. Uh, among his many books is one called The Color of Christ. His most recent book is a book about Martin Luther King, Martin Luther King, A Religious Life, which honors those themes in King's life, often lost in the contemporary discourse. So we're honored today to welcome Paul Harvey. We hope that there will be pictures, but he will make word pictures in any case. Hi, uh, thank you all for thank you all for coming today. Can you all hear me? Okay, everybody. Okay, uh, and thank you. So I can just say next slide, next slide. I guess. So I want to thank a few people here. First of all, I want to thank my wife Susie Nishida, who edits everything and usually takes out about half the stuff that I write and says, "You better write this again." <laughs> uh, and uh, also inform me today that my original clothing choice had clashing colors and I changed. So thank you for <laughs> letting me know that ahead of time. Turn, turn up. Okay. Um, and I have some uh, students here today. Uh, Tara Harvey, no relation. Uh, David Herrera, Andrew Palela, you're sitting out there somewhere. And you guys uh, uh, get extra credit points for, for coming today. Not really, but you know what I mean. Say, thank you. I really appreciate you coming. And then I want to recognize Mariana McJimsey. Mariana, Bob was a long friend of mine. I came here in 1991. I hadn't quite finished my PhD. I didn't know what the heck I was doing. Uh, and just having Bob around was such a great, uh, such a, a calming presence. And just let me kind of know that everything was gonna be okay. Uh, so uh, I'm really glad to be giving the talk in, the, um, in his honor. So today I'm gonna be giving a talk about a subject that I've been working on more or less for my entire academic career, Religion, Race, and Democracy in American History. I've never written a book by that title. However, I am writing a book by that title now, but it's not really, I should say I am writing. I'm going to be writing as soon as I get started on it, <laughs> a book by that title. Hopefully uh, get started on it soon because it's due in like a year from now. Uh, and, um, but the important thing is not really that book per se, but it's really sort of encapsulates pretty much every, all the different kinds of stuff that I've done through my, through my academic career. So I want to start with um, these two slides here uh, from March, uh, excuse me, from August 28th, 1963, the March on Washington, and from January 6th, 2021. Um, and so you all recognize the, the, the March on Washington. It was a March on Washington for jobs, justice, and freedom. Not just the March on Washington, but jobs, justice, and freedom. It's a crowd of a quarter million. One of the people there was someone that I wrote a biography about, I'm gonna talk about later, Howard Thurman. Howard Thurman was someone who preferred not to be recognized. He was just in the crowd, just as a, a figure who just happened to be there. The powerful speeches, the dream announced to the crowd. And there were also another group of people there, and that is a large swarm of FBI agents who surveilled every moment of Martin Luther King's life during the last 10 years or so of his life because he was considered already by then to be, quote, the most dangerous Negro in America. That comes from an FBI document of the time. The other photograph is from January 6, 2021, the march on Washington to overturn the clear and undisputed results of an election. The invasion of the Capitol, prayers delivered 
by the insurrectionist leaders, one of whom is dressed as a shaman, Confederate flags flying among the crowd, an imminent threat to the life of the vice president, and the ongoing crises of democratic legitimacy of our day. So one day I was looking at these two slides together, and I had a question, which is actually how I started this book. And my question is, what happened? Really, what happened to this place? Um, and the way that, so that, that's really the question, but I'll, I'll put the question in a bit more of an academic uh, language. And that is the unresolved paradox of race and religion and democracy in American history. A nation state that historically has enforced both explicitly and implicitly white Protestant norms, and at the same time, an imagined nation of pluralism and equality, both in ideology and increasingly in demographic reality. Historically, Christianity has fostered racialization. That's an academic term, which basically means the imputing of the imaginary category of race on other people, racialization. That is to say, uh, uh, but at the same time, Christianity has also undermined it. Biblical passages are powerful and ambiguous, and arguments about God's providence and colonization, proselytization, the slave trade and slavery are contentious. Christian myths and stories were central to the project of the creating racial categories in the modern world, but the Bible was also amenable to more universalist visions, and in that sense, it could never be a fully reliable ally for theorists of racial hierarchy, although they did their best to make it so. And thus, the paradox and contest to be traced in this talk, race-bound and universalist vision receiving free expression and support from the same sacred text, the Bible, the Constitution, and other various important political addresses. So for example, at the present moment, I'm teaching a class on the Civil War and Reconstruction uh, with my colleague, Barbara Hedel. And we have discussed in that class, was the Constitution an anti-slavery document or not? And I produced some writings by various scholars for the students to look at in which they are intensely, ferociously debating that same, that very question because it is not clear, it is ambiguous. In the 20th century, Christian thought helped to undermine the Christian system, which it had been instrumental in creating, ideas of cultural pluralism that percolated through the progressive intellectual world, eventually found their way into an American discourse of religious pluralism, but it took a really long time for that to happen. American traditions of religion, race, and democracy historically have undergirded movements both of anti-democratic exclusion and of democratic possibilities. A rich historical understanding may inform more inclusive possibilities with as long as we have a clear-eyed look at the realities of historical exclusion. Racially and religiously restricted notions of Americanness are a deep and at times definitive part of that history. So are the possibilities of a pluralist democracy. Because those moments of possibility too are a, fundamentally, are a fundamental part of, of the story. So let me start with a couple of slides with the theme. If you can go on to the next slide, please. Um, first slide is a, a book that I wrote some years ago called Bounds of Their Habitation, Race and Religion in American History, which began with a verse from Acts, the book of Acts 17, uh, 26, which talks about of one blood God has made all nations. Uh, and that, that was a favorite verse of abolitionists and civil rights protesters and so forth. And the rest of the verse is about how he scattered them to live in various and diverse parts of the world, implying that they were supposed to live in diverse parts of the world and not interact with each other. Obviously a favorite verse of pro-slavery theorists, of supporters of segregation and so forth. Um, and the uh, other slide is another, um, you can see the Christian cross there uh, on the day of January 6th. We go on to the next slide, please. The next is a pair of meta stories, what historians call meta narratives, that recently have emerged as contenders in our national origin stories. One is the 1619 Project. I bet many of you have heard of that. The other is the 1776, what do they call it? Uh, report, 1776, I'll just call them both projects. Uh, and what I mean by meta narrative is the story that explains all other stories, the story that subsumes all other stories. And so we've had in recent years a kind of contest about what is the real origin story of America? 
Historians, I should say, are naturally apt to be suspicious of meta-narratives. In fact, the fact that we use the term like meta-narrative implies that we understand that it's a kind of story that is a ficti in part a, a fictitious creation. And histor history is always more complicated than that. History can never be fully contained within any meta-narrative, within many story. And yet, putting to the, these two together provides a useful reference point because the key here is the tension historically between the two stories. The thesis, if you will, of the 1619 Project is that America is a land that is born with the original sin of race and slavery and that carries forward through American history and racial inequality is a, is a fundamental fact of American history to be explored. Uh, and the various essays in the 1619 Project have gone on to explore that. Uh, the 1776 report, which came out during the Trump administration, was basically a group that wanted to write an anti-1619 project report. So they wrote the 1776 report, uh, in which the classic documents of American history, the Declaration of Independence and so forth, are the, cent the central theme is liberty and democracy. And these other things are able to be overcome, like racial inequality, because of the history of liberty and democracy. So these two, historically, I think, have existed in juxtaposition. And if we assume that one is the story that subsume is, subsumes the other, that misses a fundamental tension in our history. So here, I'm going to look at a series of biographically driven narratives to humanize the rather abstract points that I've just been making here. And we will compare and contrast, for, and I've picked some figures that aren't really so well known in American history. Most, one or two are, like Martin Luther King, but these are kind of like people at the second tier that many people would not necessarily have heard of. And I've picked a couple who are Episcopalians deliberately because of the, the talk for today. I, I had to look up, I didn't, didn't know that much about them to be honest, so I had to do some research for this part of it. Uh, so we're gonna talk about, for example, the figure of David Walker from the antebellum era, Alexander Crummel, great 19th century black Episcopalian, uh, George Freeman Bragg, great 20th century black Episcopalian, Madison Grant, uh, who some of you may know from his book, um, the, uh, the passing of the great race. He was kind of like the Tucker Carlson of his era, shall we say, uh, an immigration restrictionist. Howard Thurman, uh, who I wrote a biography about because the publisher told me they didn't want to publish it because no one had ever heard of him. And I said, that's a good reason to write a biography of someone. <laughs> I'll talk about him in a little bit. So the, the key here is how wide is the compass of we? I'm using the language of the historian David Hollinger here, who says, how wide the circle of we is a fundamental question of American religious, social, and, and political history that has received various answers uh, through, um, through our history. So if we can go on to the next slide, please. Slavery shaped the writing of the Constitution, of course, is partly why we have the Electoral College, not the only reason, but part one of the reason why, and other, why we have numerous other strange elements of our political system. What I'm trying to explain to people in other countries, like when we have a presidential election, it's like, yeah, one person got more votes, but that person actually lost. And then you have to explain why, and they just kind of look at you like, you're crazy, right? You're kidding me. Um, but it, it, this, this comes from the, the compromises, of course, of the constitutional era. Uh, and some of it has to do with slavery, but it should be said that uh, many of the founding fathers, I think for pretty good reason, thought that slavery would kind of naturally, magically die of its own accord. In class, I usually say, they like to think there was a kind of magic wand that they were gonna kind of wave over the country. I think Jefferson actually thought this for a while. By the end of his life, he didn't, but for a while he did. And that, that th these problems would just sort of go away of their own accord. So, and Jefferson did things to make this happen. For example, he wrote the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, by which a good deal of the country was uh, formed. So as I say in class, when you fly over the Midwest and when you look down uh, from a, your plane and you see these perfect squares of land, you can thank the Northwest Ordinance because that's, that's, how that, that's why those squares are there. And the Northwest Ordinance was a free soil ordinance, that is to say it prohibited slavery. The Southwest Ordinance was the same, except that it allowed for slavery. And thus the great irony of antebellum America, as slavery exploded into the uh, states of the Deep South, 
so did American evangelicalism. I'm talking about the antebellum era, 1800 to 1860. And by exploded, I mean exploded. So you can't see this map very well here, but this is a map that says the domestic slave trade. So think about this. The Middle Passage, that was a period of you know, almost 400 years of the transport, uh, forcible transportation of Africans to the New World, about 400,000 of whom came to North America. Most of them came, went to Brazil, Caribbean, other places. Relatively small portion came to North America. So it's about 400,000 people from 1619 to 1808. A little bit after that, because there's a legal trade, but mostly 1619 to 1808. By contrast, what historians call the second middle passage, the internal domestic slave trade, brought almost 1 million people, 1 million African-American people from the states of the Upper South to the states of the Lower South from 1800 to 1860, forcibly. Some of them were transported on ships, so they would get on a ship in Virginia, sail around, get off in New Orleans, be sold, and then go to wherever they were gonna go. Uh, some of them were dragged in slave coffles, that is to say, groups of people tied together, being dragged down the road. Hundreds of thousands of people came to the Deep South uh, by these two uh, means, almost, almost a million, in fact. At the same time, of course, there's Indian land expropriation, the Trail of Tears, all the story that, that we know about. And at the same time, there is the explosion of American evangelicalism. So when we say, when does evangelicalism become the dominant form of religious expression in America, it is during the antebellum era. It's during what historians call the Second Great Awakening. It's a bit of an artificial term, but we'll, we'll just uh, run with it for the purposes of this talk. The migration of peoples fostered an intense search for community and created new forms of community, one of which were all kinds of Baptist, Methodist, uh, and Presbyterian uh, churches. Uh, and then, of course, you have the Anglican Church, which becomes the Episcopalian Church, which is also a deep-rooted part of this history as well. So slavery becomes America's principal way of exporting staple crops at the same time that evangelicalism becomes the dominant form of American religious expression. Are these two things connected? I do think that they are, but the connection is very complicated. So little Frederick Douglass, by the way, also thought they were connected, and he famously says, Revivals of religion and revivals in the slave trade go hand in hand together. This is Douglas's words. The slave prison and the church stand near each other. The clanking of fetters and the rattling of chains in the prison and the pious psalm and solemn prayer of the, in the church may be heard at the same time. The dealers in the bodies and souls of men erect their stand in the presence of the pulpit and they mutually help each other. The dealer gives his blood-stained gold to support the pulpit and the pulpit in return covers his infernal business with the garb of Christianity. The first naturalization law of American history from 1790 famously extended the opportunities of naturalized citizenship to, quote, free white men of good moral character. After two years of residency, they, and only they, could be naturalized and receive full privileges. At the same time, free blacks in some states enjoyed some degree of citizenship, although it varied considerably by state. You can go on to the next slide, please. Um, and this is a topic that is explored in a, a magnificent new book that some of my students sitting here have read because I signed it to them called Until Justice Be Done, um, America's First Civil Rights Movement from the Revolution to Reconstruction. And it's basically about um, the struggles of free people of color to achieve citizenship rights. They were, free people of color had a kind of half citizenship. Some states they could vote, some states they couldn't. Uh, in some, they could go to some states and they could not go to other states or territories. For example, the first uh, territorial law of Oregon in 1849 explicitly forbids black people from entering the territory of Oregon. Now you're thinking, but many black people were sailors, so they would have sailed to Portland. And would they not have gone off the ship? Yes, they could get off the ship as long as they are heavily supervised by the captain and they have all these free papers and all kinds of other stuff. So I, I make the point to students that the irony of the territorial law of Oregon is there are many paragraphs explaining exactly what uh, you can and cannot do, mostly cannot, as a free person of color in a territory that you're not legally allowed to be in, 
even though you're talking about maybe a dozen people total. But that's how obsessed they are with that uh, um, issue at the time. Free, uh, free Americans of the antebellum era staged a courageous struggle to achieve basic citizenship rights, which eventually come down to us in the form of the 14th Amendment, the most important constitutional amendment since the, since the Bill of Rights. Aside from legal strategies, they employed arguments deeply rooted in democratic and evangelical language. Jesus wants us all to be free men, for example. Meanwhile, African-American slavery paradoxically defined the meaning of freedom precisely by being its antithesis. What is freedom? It's the antithesis of being an enslaved person. But the roots of what later scholars have called civic nationalism in America, civic nationalism is the kind of ideas of the Declaration of Independence that is fundamental to our, our nationhood, took shape during these years, often through the work of black abolitionists and writers I think many people have this kind of idea that there was that, this abolitionist movement and all kinds of white people working against abolition. And there were some white people working against abolition, but the abolitionist movement started with free people of color and was carried on principally by free people of color with a small minority of white allies at that time. They capitalized on the ostensibly universalist rhetoric of some of the founding documents and, and of evangelical Christianity. Meanwhile, racial nationalism, I used the term civic nationalism earlier, that's the kind of Declaration of Independence idea. There's another form of nationalism that is pretty fundamental in American history, racial nationalism. I'm borrowing the language here from a historian named Gary Gersel. Racial nationalism emerged in intellectual life, politics, and popular culture. It derived partly from Christian myths about who was sacred and who was not. And so here we see on the right-hand side of this slide, if you can see it, the burning, there's a lot of burning in the antebellum era, the burning of the press of Elijah Lovejoy, who was a white abolitionist who had started a, a, a paper, who was attacked, who was murdered by an anti-abolitionist mob in Il Alton, Illinois in 1837, and then they set his entire press on fire. Um, some other people carried on his work after Lovejoy's death, and their press was also set on fire. I think it was something like a dozen presses eventually came to be set on fire. And the fact that they use fire to me suggests a, a, a profound notion of impurity that had to be burned away, the impurity of the, the mixing of the races. Later during the Civil War, anti-draft protesters in July of 1863 burned and these are mostly working class people in New York, largely Irish immigrants who don't want to be drafted and have no interest in fighting um, for a war that they perceive to have become a war against slavery, which really by that time it had. Uh, they burn a black orphanage. They kill over a dozen African Americans. Uh, eventually something like 110 people die during the New York City draft riots of 18, July 1863. And the New York City draft riots are eventually quelled because soldiers from the battle biggest battle in the Western Hemisphere ever, Gettysburg marched to New York City to put down the riot later in July of 1863. It's only like two weeks after the Battle of Gettysburg. If we go on to the next slide, please. Um, here are two of the people that are debating, free men of color who are debating about how to fight against this kind of racial nationalism. David Walker and Henry on the left-hand side. That's his book, David Walker's Appeal. On the right-hand right -hand side, Henry Highland Garnett. So I think almost everybody knows Frederick Douglass. He's kind of like a celebrity now in American history. There's all these other people who are equal in the antebellum era to Frederick Douglass that I find typically nobody has ever heard of. Uh, James W.C. Pennington, for example. I spent a summer in Germany a few years ago because I had received the Pennington Award. James W.C. Pennington was a black abolitionist who got uh, an honorary doctorate from Heidelberg University, and so they have now a Pennington Award as a result of that. Another one is Henry Highland Garnett, who was a Presbyterian minister. He was an escaped slave, self-educated, became a Presbyterian minister. And in 1843, he and Frederick Douglass have a very famous debate at a colored convention. There was something called the Colored Conventions Movement, which is free men of color who were meeting to argue for citizenship rights. This goes on all through the antebellum era. And they have a famous clash in 1843, and the clash is over um, 
but how? How do we fight the powers that be? Uh, in other words, how do we fight against slavery? Is violence necessary and useful as a tool to fight against slavery? Frederick Douglass said no. Henry Highland Garnett said yes. And they fight it out on the pages of the, of the that, you, that you can now read. These are now available online, by the way, that you can read from the, their debate in Buffalo in 1843. However, it must be said, Frederick Douglass did not argue against violence to protest slavery out of some principle. He just thought it wouldn't work. Basically, he said, go ahead and try that, but you're just going to end up dead. What good is that, right? Uh, and Henry Highland Garnett said, any, pers any man who wants to preserve his manhood must be able to defend it physically when, when called upon. I should say that Frederick Douglass later changed his mind because, of course, he did support violence during the Civil War because he recruited African-American soldiers to serve in the Union Army, including two of his own sons. David Walker, on the left-hand side, writes this very, it's one of the first black abolitionist pamphlets in American history called David Walker's Appeal. Um, he says, God had not made any men to be slaves. God had made men to fight against slavery violently if necessary. Um, for all were but as, quote, dying worms in the eyes of the Creator, and whites too would have to appear before the Lord's judgment in the last day and account for their deeds. Christian messianism, prevalent in the antebellum era, deeply influences David Walker, uh, and David Walker's pamphlets begin circulating secretly all through the country. This is an era, of course, in which abolitionist pamphlets were not allowed to be mailed to any of the southern states. Uh, and so some free men of color were trying to smuggle David Walker's pamphlets into, um, into the South. David Walker's house, by the way, he lived in Boston when he died. He died of tuberculosis in 1830. One, I believe it was, um, and it can be visited as part of what is now called the African American Freedom Trail, which is in Beacon Hill in Boston. Um, so lots and lots of people go to Boston and follow the American Revolutionary sites and the, the so-called Freedom Trail. And the wife of Howard Thurman created the African American Freedom Trail. And I did this a few years ago when I was researching Howard Thurman, and I discovered all these black abolitionists lived like three blocks from each other. I didn't, I know they all lived in Boston, but you forget how small the world was in, in the 19th century. So I'm walking by, oh, this is where David Walker lived. It's where Mariah Stewart lived. Oh, here's the First African Baptist Church, which was the primary center of black abolitionism in Boston in the antebellum era. So despite the biblical admonition that in Christ there was neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, American evangelicalism nonetheless reinforced uh, racial and policed racial hierarchies in American society. And so we have the kind of great paradox that when you look at English abolitionism, very influenced by English evangelicalism, William Wilberforce, people like that, and um, it succeeds in eliminating and, and abolishing slavery in the English colonies in 1833. Uh, and the, the brunt of English evangelicalism tends toward abolitionism. There's some of that in the United States, but the brunt of Amer American evangelicalism ends up supporting, in fact, the pro-slavery movement, the pro-slavery idea. And the pro-slavery idea is basically that God has created us to serve our roles within the social order, the social station that God has put us into, uh, and to disobey the role that we are supposed to play in that social station means disobeying God. Uh, you may recognize that argument because it's, it's a kind of historic 18th, 17th, 18th century conservative anti revolutionary argument, why revolutions are bad because people need to stay in their social station. So American evangelicals are busy adopting those through the course of the, of the 19th century. Um, next slide, please. Now we move on to our first Episcopalian of the day, Alexander Crummel. Alexander Crummel was born in New York, a free person of color, um, and attended one of the first schools for, for free blacks in, uh, in New York. And he grew up in a house in which the very first black abolitionist journal was actually published, a, a newspaper called Freedom's Journal. Crummel start, struggled to get an education. Uh, whites burned down the first high school that he attended, 
later he hoped to, but was refused the right to attend the General Theological Seminary of the Episcopal Church. He became an Episcopal priest anyway, but he was told he could only take a pulpit in Philadelphia if he took a pulpit that was in a segregated jurisdiction of the Episcopal Church. He refused to do so. He later went to Liberia. Uh, there's another long history behind the, the formation of Liberia, which I don't have time to get into here. Uh, but he spent about 20 years there. And he was part of the movement that was coming to be called Pan-Africanism. That is to say, the idea that people of color in Africa and the United States shared something fundamentally in common. Came back home in the 1870s, was called as the pastor of St. Mary's Episcopal Mission in Washington, D.C. Um, and founded St. Luke's Episcopal Church, the first independent black Episcopal church in, the, in um, DC. He served as a rector there until his retirement in 1894. And very late in his life, um, his works that he wrote, he wrote many, many philosophical works, came to be collected, one of which that you see there is a collection of his works called Destiny and Race. He was a, a kind of person that we would refer to as a 19th century romantic racialist, not racist, racialist. And romantic racialism is the idea that all peoples of the world are imbued with a certain kind of spirit and have something to contribute to the world. And that's kind of God's plan for the melding of different attributes that different people have. For those of you who know the work of W.E.B. Du Bois, you'll recognize that he says exactly the same thing, exactly the same thing in his great book, Souls of Black Folk, published in 1903. Du Bois met Crummel very late in his life. Du Bois was a professor at Wilberforce University. Du Bois revered, revered Crummel. He was probably the most important person in forming Du Bois' uh, thought. And du Bois is the most important black intellectual of the, of the 20th century. Uh, next slide, please. Others at the same time, including Frederick Douglass, were beginning to envision a multicultural America. Almost nobody was envisioning that at the time, except for Frederick Douglass and a, and a few others. And so Frederick Douglass gives a speech that I consider one of the great speeches of American history. If you're gonna put your like top 10 speeches, Gettysburg Address, Martin Luther King's Address, a few others like that. Um, I think that the composite nation's gotta be in the top five, except no one's ever heard of it. <laughs> uh, and so I, I make sure students hear of it. And in the composite nation speech, he says, I'm gonna read this because you can't read it very well there. We shall spread the network of our science and civilization over all who seek their shelter, whether from Asia, Africa, or the Isles of the Sea. We shall mold them all, each after his kind, into Americans, Indian and Celt, Negro and Saxon, Latin and Teuton, Mongolian and Caucasian, Jew and Gentile, all shall here bow to the same law, enjoy the same liberty, vibrate with the same national enthusiasm and seek the same national ends. So about a hundred years before it begins to become any kind of demographic reality, I think that he is forecasting the prophesying in effect the future of a multicultural America. However, for much of the 19th century, that view was um, a minority to, to view, to, to say the least. And in fact, race and religion were joined in a project of a, a civilizing mission. In other words, Christianizing others involved civilizing them. Sometimes, quite often in fact, this involved brutally stripping colonial subjects, particularly Native Americans, of the garments of their own civilization. At other times, the joining of Christianization and civilization underwrote idealistic crusades of bringing formerly enslaved peoples into American civilization, as in the abolitionist movement. So we have the great irony of this era. So if you look at a, a picture of a kind of former abolitionist leader who becomes a uh, uh, advocate for racial equality after the Civil War. And you have a, a handful of, of whites who are like this. And many of them form, contribute to and form historically black colleges and university, Morehouse College, Howard University, places like that. These are all formed after, right after the Civil War. Um, fast forward 20 years, and so this, this is kind of a heroic story that we like to tell ourselves. Fast forward 20 years, and if you go to the next slide, please. Um, I'm sorry, next slide, please. 
Um, and we have figures like Richard Pratt that you see there on the right. Richard Pratt was the founder of the Carlisle School, uh, one of the Indian boarding schools of that era. Richard Pratt was also an abolitionist as well. And they are forming the boarding schools, and we know the outcome of those, the tragic outcome of those. But in fact, abolitionists and those who really wanted to create a kind of idea of equal citizenship after the Civil War are doing both of the same things at the same time, and we have to kind of recognize that as we struggle to comprehend both the heroism and the short-sightedness of, of those people, including uh, folks like Pratt. Um, in other instances, the intertwining of Christianity, civilization, and whiteness justified the complete exclusion of peoples from the American Republic, notably in the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. And a racialized definition of Christian citizenship reemerged with force in the later 19th century. It soon informed the reasoning employed in court cases and legislative debates going on into the, into the 20th century. For example, uh, we can look at a work such as, on the left-hand side, Our Country, by a very important Congregationalist minister named Josiah Strong. This is from 1885. He heralded Anglo-Saxons as the bearers of a, quote, pure spiritual Christianity. We can go on to the next slide. Um, and um, he says, the other great idea of which the Anglo-Saxon is the exponent is that of a pure spiritual Christianity. It was no accident that the great reformation of the 16th century originated among a Teutonic rather than a Latin people. Contrast that with what you just heard from Frederick Douglass, that this is a land for both the Latin and the Teuton. And you see here what is in fact the more common view of that era. It was the fire of liberty burning in the Saxon heart that framed up flamed up against the absolutism of the Pope. There can be no reasonable doubt that North America is to be the great home of the Anglo-Saxon, the principal seat of his power, the center of his life and influence. This is a book in 1885 that basically replays the same arguments that Lyman Beecher, great Congregationalist minister and abolitionist of the antebellum era, had proposed in the 1830s in a work called A Plea for the West. And A Plea for the West is basically Protestants have to take over the West, the Western territories before Catholics do, because otherwise democracy will die. Uh, Josiah Strong basically says the same thing in, in 1885. Um, and, and obviously you can see the racialized language that he's using here as well. In short, the connections between religion and race were complicated. Idealism and brutality often went hand in hand as did notions of inclusion together with the instruments of exclusion. Next slide, please. So white American Christian nationalism, in effect, eventually recreated itself within the new constitutional structures that came out of the Civil War. The glorious failure, it's a term that W.E. Du Bois uses, the glorious failure of Reconstruction was quickly adapted and balderized by authors such as the Southern Baptist minister and theatrical actor Thomas Dixon. You can, on the right-hand side, you see his novel called The Klansman from 1905. The Klansman is the novel from which the technically brilliant, brilliant but otherwise utterly horrific movie Birth of a Nation was made and premiered in 1950. And The Birth of a Nation is basically how the Klan comes to save the day and saves American democracy after the Civil War. It's a horrible story, despite the, the brilliance of the, of the filmmaking. Um, but that form of racial nationalism also took form during a period of massive immigration of Catholics and largely of Catholics and Jews. 25 million people, more or less, from 1880 to 1920 immigrate to the United States. It's the great period of immigration the greatest period of immigration of American history until more recent years, until the post-1965 years. Um, and it was the same time as the domination of the last groups of native peoples who fought to preserve their lands and liberties in the West. These racialized conceptions of nationalism, again, we come back to racial nationalism, um, arose with the rapid pluralization of the American populace because there was a sort of fear of what Madison Grant, New York lawyer, conservationist, environmentalist, eugenicist, believer in eugenics, uh, 
expresses in his 1916 book, very popular at the time, called The Passing of the Great Race. Um, and the passing of the great race is basically an argument that the, the character of immigrants coming to the country from 1880 to 1920, who are not truly Nordic peoples, will therefore destroy the basis for American democracy because the basis for American democracy is the principles etched in the great documents of the Nordic peoples. Anglo-Saxon peoples really is what he, what he means when he says Nordics. He says, the Nordic race is inherently superior to other human races. The Nordic character of American life has been undermined by the mass immigration of people from inferior racial stocks. So what happens as a result of this? The National Origins Act of 1924, a very important immigration law, which basically is a, there's a lot of technical details, but basically it's trying to stem the tide of Catholic and Jewish immigration from Southern and, and Eastern Europe. And it does so, in fact, quite effectively. Um, and one of the consequences that no one foresaw at the time that, that, that we know, know, now know about is the tragic story of America's inadequate response to the Holocaust. And a lot of that came because there was a very small number of people who could be accepted according to the immigration law of 1924, and it was very difficult to get the federal government to do anything to get around that law. And by the time the federal government did it, which is basically 1944, it was too late. It was too late. So a couple of hundred thousand Jews immigrated to the United States, late 1930s, 1940s. That's not nothing, but it's um, a, a tragically small figure given what uh, what else we know happened during that time. Next slide, please. So now we come back to our proponents of civic nationalism. Again, we're looking at the, the, the conversation throughout of civic nationalism and, and racial nationalism in the persons of W.E.B. Du Bois on the right. That's a book called W.E.B. Du Bois, American Prophet, written by a, a co-author of mine, Edward J. Bloom. And on the left, a figure that not many people have heard of, and not many people know anything about, including me, until I wrote this talk, uh, George Freeman Bragg. George Freeman Bragg was a very important black Episcopalian of the early 20th century. So um, Bragg, like Alexander Crummel before him, had tried to enter a Episcopalian theological seminary in Virginia. This was in the 1870s. He was refused admittance. Uh, he found his way eventually to become a, an Episcopal priest, and in 1891, he accepted a call and became a rector of the oldest black Episcopal congregation in the South in Baltimore, St. James Episcopal Church, founded in 1824. He served that congregation for 49 years until his death. And by 1924, it was in fact among the largest black Episcopal parishes in the country with over 500 parishioners. So if you think of after the Civil War, the kind of principal story of African-American churches is separation of white churches and African-American churches. So you have the Black Baptist Church, the Black Methodist Church, and so forth. And that is indeed the majority story. Uh, there are these other stories of black Catholics and black Episcopalians who remain within their church bodies and struggle for independence within predominantly white church bodies. George Freeman Bragg was one of them because he thought the Episcopal Church provided order, grace, and discipline to a people free people who needed it. Bragg continued to social activism, and he later joined with W.E.B. Du Bois as one of the founders of the Niagara Movement, which is a kind of predecessor to the NAACP. Du Bois, of course, is the, maybe the best known figure that I'm talking about here. In 1903, he publishes Souls of Black Folk, and I sometimes ask my students, um, why did Du Bois use the term souls of black folk? folk? Why did he use, what does folk mean? And they often say like folks, like folks, you know, let's go folks, come on. <laughs> Just the, the, the colloquial way that, that we use it now. But in fact, he's using it from the German Volk, which means a people who have a spiritual mission in the world, the souls of black folk, because he had studied with Max Weber in Germany during his PhD years. And so it has, a, it has a profound spiritual meaning that's very hard for us to capture because we have the colloquial idea of what folk mean, means. 
Du Bois wrote, quote, one ever feels this two-ness, an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals, and one dark body whose strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. My friend and co-author Edward Bloom refers to him as an American prophet, even though he was professedly an atheist and became kind of a militant atheist, shall we say, towards the latter part of his life. And yet all of his writings are rich and full of spiritual language, including a story he wrote in the 1920s called Jesus Christ in Texas. So Jesus Christ comes to Texas as a black man. Guess what happens to him? Of course, he gets lynched. Right? So that he's, while he's an atheist, he's writing stories like that because I think the, the, the kind of spiritual language just came naturally to him. Du Bois was a friend and subject to one of my favorite people in the world. Next slide, please. Um, let's skip that one. Let's go to the next slide. Yeah, uh, Howard Thurman on the left there. This is a book called Howard Thurman and the Disinherited. Howard Thurman's best known book is called Jesus and the Disinherited. It's kind of his signature book of his life. Uh, and so I, I chose to call my book Howard Thurman and the, and the Disinherited. Uh, and Howard Thurman in the 1930s and 40s was creating and propagating the ideas of nonviolent civil disobedience, a kind of, kind of intellectual, I would say spiritually elite idea. He goes to India in 1936, meets with Gandhi, comes back to America, enthused with these ideas, explodes with essays and sermons that are now collected and easy for you to read if you read the Howard Thurman papers. Uh, and he is educating people at Howard University who formed the Congress of Racial Equality, who later formed the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, uh, and who are working for the NAACP. All, all of the civil rights groups of this era are coming to a man who liked to talk in poetry, in poetry, and who was not involved as a physical person with civil rights marches because he preferred not to be. He preferred to talk to people quietly behind the scenes and ask them, who are you, really? That was his favorite question, who are you, really? Um, and he was doing all this in a time in which, I skipped over the slide a second ago, but a time in which American fascism was strongly on the march in the 1930s. For example, the largest radio commentator, I happen to have the name of a radio commentator, Paul Harvey, right? You all know that. Uh, so in the 1930s, if my name was Charles Coughlin, you would have known exactly who that was because he was kind of like the Paul Harvey of that era. So he had this huge audience. He was a, called a radio priest because he was a Catholic priest. And Charles Coughlin was a fascist, period. Straight up Catholic fascist. And he had the largest, aside from FDR, he had the largest radio audience of that, um, of that era. Uh, and of course, there was the America First movement, an isolationist movement led by Charles Lindbergh, which is very sympathetic to European fascism and, and quite important in American history until Pearl Harbor makes it irrelevant, but, but has, has its say and has many celebrities on its side up to that time. So Howard Thurman is writing his great sermons and addresses through all this period, and he writes a, a great address called the Fascist, Fascist Masquerade, the Fascist Masquerade. And he says, it's no answer to say that fascism represents a false interpretation of Christianity. Because, in fact, he says, they represent the church and the state only too well. Thurman's greatest book from 1949, Jesus and the Disinherited, basically depicts Jesus as a kind of Jewish subject of the Roman imperial state. And the, the analogies to the sufferings of African American and the American colonial state are, are, are very obvious. He spent his life trying to answer the question, what could religion mean to the man whose back is against the wall? What could a Christianity that had historically been aligned with forces of power and authority say to the disinherited, the dispossessed? So his form of dissonant, uh, uh, Christ, the Christianity of dissent goes back to the language of Frederick Douglass to the 19th century. He spent his life exploring what the religion of Jesus and religion as a general philosophical expression in distinction to institutional Christianity uh, that he had seen practiced in the United States, what that could mean in the lives of ordinary people. Thurman's ideas, of course, were fundamental in the life of Martin Luther King, 
Uh, Martin Luther King was a, a student of Thurman's in the 1950s, and King evidently carried a copy of Jesus and the Disinherited in his coat pocket during the Montgomery bus boycott of 1955. And I've often wondered if that story is apocryphal or not, but when you read King's addresses, King is flat out plagiarizing Howard Thurman, word for word, word for word, in fact. Uh, and so it, the, the, the evidence there is, is clear. Martin Luther King, I think, some of you have heard me talk about King before. Martin Luther King, his fate was to be made into a mortar. And the thing with mortars is they are made into saints. And the thing with saints is they are made into alabaster monuments, right? And the thing with alabaster monuments is that they are whittled down so that we can all agree on what these people mean. And what we all agree on what they mean is some kind of fairly harmless cliche. I think this is what happened, has happened to Martin Luther King. So as Susie can testify, every year on Martin Luther King Day, I have to read the editorial in the Gazette Telegraph, and every year it is the worst balderization of the true message of Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King was a social democrat, a social gospeler, and he called himself a profound advocator of the social gospel. This is in 1948 when he was 19 years old in seminary. In the 1950s and through the height of the civil rights movement, he was preaching social democracy, economic justice, the equalization of incomes, and the connection between the black American freedom struggle and anti-colonial movements abroad. So I have much more to say about that, but I'll just sort of leave it at that. King's mortardom has created an alabaster figure that is fundamentally misunderstood, in my opinion, uh, by Americans. The civil rights movement had a strong connection to mainstream Protestant and liberal Catholic parishes through the 60s. Next slide, please. Um, I picked here a few books. Um, mainstream religion of the mid 20th century has been sort of uh, misunderstood and denigrated, I think. Uh, and historians are busy recovering that. The book that you see there on the right is called Before the Religious Right, Liberal Protestants, Human Rights, and can't read the rest of the subtitle. It's about liberal Protestants and human rights through the 1940s and 1950s up to the 1960s. So, sorry? Polarization. The, the pol and the polarization of the United States, thank you. Uh, the middle book is called Open Hearts, Closed Doors, and it's about the very important influence of mainstream Protestants on the passage of the 1965 Heart Cellar Act, which is an act that fundamentally recreates the American immigration system. The book on the left is called The Color of America Has Changed, which is a book about civil rights in California a state that is not black and white, but a state that is black and white and Native American and Latino uh, and Asian. Uh, and so the color of America change means that the civil rights movement is going to take on. But again, liberal Catholic parishes and liberal Protestants are fundamentally involved in the politics of that era. Through the 1940s and 1950s, American ecumenical Protestants and liberal Catholics imagined, as Zubovich puts it, a more democratic country that promoted justice for racial minorities and economic rights for workers. Some pushed for a world government that would reinvigorate democracy at home. And the thing that they really did is they understood the American racial struggle as one subset of the larger struggle for universal human rights. Because they were, they were important in creating our, our vision, our contemporary vision of what, of what human rights means. Zubovitz says, human rights provided the framework within which, within which they understood and justified their political work on racism, economic reform, and foreign affairs. Next slide, please. So now I'm just going to say a couple of things about uh, the contemporary era. On the left-hand side, you see a book by the Reverend William Barber. I dedicated my book on Martin Luther King to the Reverend William Barber, um, who is to me a, a kind of African-American mainstream Protestant who is the best representative of the King tradition in contemporary politics has led a movement called the Moral Mondays Movement in North Carolina to fight against what was in fact in the 2010s a really blatant attempt to disfranchise black voters, a surgical attack. Surgical is the word used by the North Carolina Supreme Court at the time when it, it turned down the, 
the state legislature's attempt, a surgical attack on the voting rights of, of African Americans. Um, and on the right-hand side, you see a book called American Covenant, which is a, a history of the idea of civil religion in America, which presents many ideas similar to what I'm, I'm talking about today. But it talks about the adaptability of civil religion as a uh, sort of rhetorical device that has had many harmful impacts in American history, but nonetheless retains its ability to lead to a more democratic future. Next slide, last slide, last two slides. So I'm gonna say just a couple of things very quickly at the end here about um, an important local figure that is Milton Proby. So we all know him because we drive on his highway to go to the airport, right? So Milton Proby was a, some of you, I don't know, may, may have known him personally, I didn't, but he only died in 2005. He's a longtime pastor of a Black Baptist church in Colorado Springs, grew up in Texas, uh, was a very good friend of Martin Luther King, served on all kinds of civil rights commissions, human rights commissions, and so forth, and became a kind of advocate for um, human rights and civil rights in, in the city of Colorado Springs. We should say that the city of Colorado Springs, which I'll talk much more about tomorrow, was never officially a segregated city in any way, but like many Western and Northern cities, it had a kind of unofficial, random system of segregation. Hotels where you could stay, as an African-American in hotels where you couldn't stay. And you had to know which one was which. That's why you have the Green Book. The Green Book, which instructed African-American travelers about where they could and couldn't stay in these mysterious, opaque systems of de facto segregation that kind of, op kind of operated and kind of didn't. You never really know for sure in um, the states that were not legally segregated. That is to say the states in the, in the North and the in the West. Um, last slide. Next slide. So tomorrow I'm going to be talking about this in more detail. In a, it won't be a formal talk, but more like an informal conversation called "Can We Live Together: From Culture Wars to Cultural Coexistence in Colorado Springs." Um, I flat out stole this idea from a colleague of mine named George Bayuga, who's an anthropologist at UCCS. Um, because he had showed me this grant from the Luce Foundation and said, we should apply for this. So I said, hey, I got this book, Religion, Race, and Democracy in America, let's apply for that. And he had this other idea, why don't we look at this thing locally? It had never occurred to me, Leah, to do local history, I gotta say, <laughs> but here we are, <laughs> right? Uh, mostly, thanks to George, mostly. Uh, and uh, we have recently been awarded a $300,000 grant from the Luce Foundation to do a book, a documentary, oral histories, ethnographies, what all, I don't know. We just learned this, so we're, we're gonna figure out next year what, what all we're gonna do with this. But we're going to be thinking about the question about um, the ways in which this community has changed over the last 30 years. I say 30 years, because that's about how long I've lived here. I think about what the, it felt like in 1991 when I came here and what it feels like now. And it, it's just different. I think better, largely. Not totally better, but I think largely better. And if you think about what has happened to the United States during that time in terms of trends of political polarization, it is not better. It's worse. Uh, so if I am right in thinking that, it is to a pretty good degree better here in a time in which it has gotten worse generally nationally Maybe you disagree with that, we can talk about it, but if I am right about that, what, why, what is the cause of that? And what can we learn from the local experience about learning to live together with diverse groups of people bunched up against one another? So the diverse groups of people that we're talking about here are uh, A, the military, that's the largest group in the Colorado Springs is a city built by the military industrial complex, we all know that, uh, B, uh, evangelical organizations, Focus on the Family, Compassion International, all the ones that, that you know about. Um, C, the gay community, which is growing and thriving in Colorado Springs. Um, D, mainstream Protestants, Catholics, Jews, um, Muslims um, that, that carry on their, their religious traditions. Um, 
sort of as they always have, and this goes back, of course, to the founding of Colorado Springs by General Palmer. Um, and what can we learn about, what, what lessons can we learn about how to live together better than is taking place in other, other parts of the United States? So we're gonna be exploring this over the next several years um, with this grant, hopefully with some other grants, we'll see. <laughs> uh, and um, and to, to think about what lessons this may teach us about political, cultural, and religious polarization and the means by which we can overcome that. And to come back to my talk and to conclude this talk, this is another way of saying, how can we make this tradition of civic nationalism that has always been at war against this other tradition of racial nationalism, how can we make this, the tradition of civic nationalism, uh, how can we reaffirm it, make it stronger, and uh, use it to create a more purposefully democratic public language by which we can live together? Thank you guys for listening today. I know that Paul will be willing to entertain questions here. Before we start those questions, I want to remind you that as he alluded in his talk, this is a two-part series co-sponsored by Grace, Grace and St. Stephen's Episcopal Church and Colorado College that there's another related talk tomorrow at 12.15 in the Timothy Fuller event space in our library. That's the one with the orange panels, which people have opinions about. So uh, also that there will be a reception for informal questions in the parish hall to your left. Um, after we have some questions here, this is the reception is the gift with civilized uh, potables of the McGimsey family and the history department at Colorado College. But let's have some, I, just in case you needed to go, I'm, I'm letting you know you can come back tomorrow and we will do more of this, that there will also be an opportunity to extend questions this evening. But now we would welcome several questions here, whatever's on the top of your mind, and Paul Harvey will, will deal. Andrew. <coughs> <laughs> Good. Can you repeat yeah, yeah um, were, were the abolitionists primarily secularly or religiously motivated? The answer is yes. Okay. <laughs> the answer is yes. Uh, and, and both in many ways, but um, there was no, it was very hard to be a wholly secular person in antebellum America. Like that category almost didn't exist. There were a few outlier atheists and kind of village atheists and things like that. But to, to speak a public language in American political life in the 19th century, you had to adopt certain kind of rhetorical forms deeply influenced by Christian forms, and it just wasn't any other way. So um, whether they were individually, like, like Frederick Douglass, for example, so he's a very religious man, a Methodist in the 1840s. By the 1870s, I would call him a vague Unitarian. Um, William Lloyd Garrison, white, best known white abolitionist, forms the Liberator in 1831. And he basically says, yeah, the pro-slavery people are right. The Bible is pro-slavery. It just is. So let's just get rid of the Bible. Or get rid of it. Like some parts of the Bible are just wrong. So let's just toss them out. And let's, let's just read the parts of the Bible that actually are good. Because not all of it, some of it's terrible. Let's get rid of the terrible parts and just focus on the good parts. Uh, so he, was a, he grew up as a Baptist and he sort of started his life as an abolitionist, but he became a kind of Unitarian as well. And this happens to a lot of abolitionists because the pro-slavery religious argument, in my opinion, wins in the antebellum era. It wins the debate, regrettably. Yes? Just a comment about Colorado Springs is a lot of black folks came here in the 1920s and to Los Angeles because they were the only cities that were Republican, the party of the yeah, yeah. Because all the Democratic cities, Philadelphia, New York, San Francisco, were really racist cities. Yep. That's a good point. I had not thought of that. That's a, that's a great point, yeah. And, you know, Marcus Garvey spoke. Right? He did? In, in Gaylord Hall. <laughs> I didn't know that. I did not know that. <laughs> 
then you have this vibrant black community that had come to be in a town that is still at least a remnant. I mean, we know the Republican Party right on the 1920s was, you know, well, it was better than the Democratic Party. Um, <clears throat> they were both terrible, I would say, at the time. It, well, yeah. <laughs> but it was still, they, they came to a town where it was the party. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but there, there's the tradition of, of Lincolnian republicanism, yeah. Well, it's Marcus Garvey spoke. Yeah. Just up the street. <laughs> I know what I'm going to be researching in the next few days. <laughs> I didn't, because I didn't know that. Uh, I have, I have identified. You should have told me that a long time ago. <laughs> yes. Yes, <laughs> so, some, some of both. So I would say that the, the question is, is the rise of what some people refer to as Christian nationalism, I'm, I'm not a great fan of that term, to be perfectly honest, because um, it, it's a sort of a, I don't want to get into that. Anyway, what, whatever you call it, like there, there is something out there that some people refer to as Christian nationalism. And does this come from all this past stuff that I'm talking about, or is it something new and different? So my, my uh, jokey but correct answer is yes, because of course it has everything to do with this kind of long tradition of racial nationalism that I've been talking about. But it also has a lot to do with changing of the country that I think largely has to do with economic inequality since the, 19, about the mid 1970s. So, Economic historians refer to kind of the great convergence. This is a sort of convergence of incomes in American history from the 1930s to about the mid 1970s. And since the mid 1970s, for all kinds of complicated reasons, there's been a sort of divergence of income, greater at some times, lesser in others. Uh, and actually is somewhat less so in the last couple of years from recent statistics I've seen. But I, I think that also has a lot to do with it. And I think a lot of the anger of American politics has to be connected to that. And that's, so that's the different part. Okay, the same part is the fact that commentators can be on the largest watched public uh, cable channels every night talking about ideas that are straight up Madison Grant. Straight up Madison Grant, I mean, word for word almost. Okay, he, he's not on TV anymore, but you know, like he was for a long time. Is it like, it, like, how is that possible? It's possible because it's a long tradition in American history, and we, we almost always have people like that. Father Coughlin was like that in the, in the 1930s. All kinds of people were like that in the 1960s. All kinds of people who aren't known that are on small AM radio stations all over the country. If you're driving across the country, I like to listen to them because they're kind of interesting for my research. Uh, and um, like there's a lot of people out there who are unconsciously replaying the rhetoric of racial nationalism. They, yeah, they can, they can gently, I don't know about pursue, they can gently follow me into the next <laughs> Forgot my water. I need to remember that next time. <laughs> 